Hi guys, I'm back again today with another reaction video and today we are continuing with our Power Rangers Beast Morphers. Um, this is the last part. So before we do start, don't forget to subscribe, click the bell button, check out my Patreon in the comments, I mean in the description and also check out Buy Me A Coffee if you want to make a request like this. Let's get it. And your voice isn't as good now. That's unfortunate. I we cut remember. to a year later where Scrozzle is captured by Colonel Truman. Apparently, Scrozzle decided to hide in the RPM universe. Devin is now in charge of Grid Battle Force while Commander Shaw was promoted to General, and they've decided to switch over to other alternate renewable energy sources like wind and solar instead of Morphex. Even though the use of Morphex energy wasn't really the problem, it was just, you know, the evil virus from a different dimension mm. infused with snake DNA. The others are still around and still doing their thing as rangers. Steel became an actor with Blaze as his stunt double, and everyone gets together again to wish Steel a happy first birthday. Birthday. Everyone dancing to a bizarre song that had been in an earlier episode where Steel and Nate switched bodies for a day. There was a whole song and dance number that diegetically happened in universe. Like it was frickin' Xanadu. And that's how we end the series. Beast Morphers is a step up from Ninja Steel in a number of ways, but arguably it fits along similar lines of it in terms of the ratio of ongoing story episodes to filler episodes. However, what makes it superior to Ninja Steel in that regard is that all the Rangers get a lot more focus episodes and their own individual arcs, which we'll discuss at the end. Ninja Steel, by contrast, seemed to forget a couple of its characters beyond them being part of the group and didn't have any interesting developments that really lasted for the rest of the show. As I said earlier, for some fans, the reveal of Evox is Vengex felt disappointing, not because we finally had resolution on the cliffhanger, but that it felt tacked on in the vain hope of making their finale more interesting because there wasn't enough from the villains to make it interesting otherwise. They're not entirely wrong in terms of it being interesting. The villains are pretty lackluster this season, despite having some very unique dynamics to them. In particular, the avatars of Roxy and Blaze, looking like people they knew, the potential for subterfuge and emotional manipulation. Unfortunately, that aspect was very under utilized. Not completely forgotten, there are a handful of episodes where they trick the rangers because of who they look like, but it felt like there should have been more to them, especially at the end where they just started mutating themselves to try to gain more power. How about a story where one or both of them starts realizing what they've done to themselves? Yeah, like, um, whilst we were watching this, I was like, it was a waste that they didn't become rangers because... Um, I mean, I think I would have liked their characters as rangers as well, or like better uh, character development than them just being the bad guys. It was just, even if it, I'm just watching the summary, I'm not necessarily watching the uh, season or the episode. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it just felt like they could have done so much with their characters, but... It was just eh. That they're unrecognizable and don't want this anymore. Realizing that their own desire for power is changing them in ways so they're not who they think they are. Adding in further identity issues by virtue of them being evil clones of real people. You could have a tragedy there with one just completely losing themselves until they're destroyed and the other turns on Evox to try to stop it from happening to them too. Maybe sacrificing themselves for the real one or something along those lines. I mentioned last time that the show struggles with non-suit actor villains. But this one had two that just didn't do much either. Scrozzle was boring, and for some bizarre reason, up until the finale, I kept forgetting his name. No, seriously, I kept having to look back at a wiki and my own script here to remember what the hell his name was. It's not like it isn't said enough. I could have made it a recurring gag, called him Scrabble or Scrotum or something, but... Honest to God, it didn't occur to me because I just legit had a struggle remembering what the hell his name was. He was very selfish and opportunistic, ready to play the avatars against each other and prop himself up to Evox. But that was it. Nothing more to it or to him. Evox is Vengex I pretty much discussed already at the reveal. He's not a great villain, though the reveal of him as Vengex does prop him up a bit. It's also a reveal that was sadly spoiled for me by fans who wanted to know how I felt about it. As a reminder, I do not watch the show as it airs anymore. I start watching it when I start working on the History of Power Rangers video for it. Aww. As in, a few days before that comes out. I won't start watching Dino Fury until 2023 and after the series is over. I'm just not as invested in the show anymore, and I lack the free time to do it for fun anyway. And let's face it, if a series is bad like it was with Samurai and Megaforce, 
It means I watched something painful twice. Fortunately, Beast Morphers is not Makes a bad sense. series. Knowing ahead of time that Evox's Vengex does paint some of his behavior in a slightly odd light, but as I said, changes to his program could mean changes to his attitude. Plus the simple fact that we're dealing with different writers than the ones who worked on RPM. Some writers can follow through on writing someone else's character and have it be exactly the same. Others will try to give their own spin on things. Ben and Betty are a bit controversial in the fan them. Some being happy that their humor doesn't contain any flatulence jokes like Victor and Monty had. Though personally, despite that bit of gross-out humor, I think I preferred Victor and Monty as comic relief, honestly. The thing is that Ben and Betty bumble a bit and have bad things happen to them or slime gets thrown on them, but they're not malicious. They're honestly trying to help, and in their defense, they're not that stupid. They show multiple times to have electronic and mechanical aptitude and do successfully build things. It's just the items they create are a little too good, or they don't think to program limits on how they operate. And despite the occasional incompetence, they're quite brave and still happy to run into danger to help the rangers. They understand their duty and responsibility. It's just, they're bumblers. Hell, they even teach a rock climbing class in one episode, and they were the ones who apparently caught Scrozzle in the RPM universe. And the rangers don't mock them for their bumbling. They never bully them. At worst, they get a good laugh at the situation, but only when Ben and Betty themselves seem okay with it. To the rangers, the two are not the butt of the joke. They're in on it. Unless they're not, in which case the team shows concern. Although sometimes their bumbling is just... bizarre. Like when a frickin' 12-year-old half their size bullies them, even though they are, at the very minimum, teenagers themselves. But that's also what kind of works against them for comic relief. Victor and Monty were arrogant pricks so full of themselves that they seemed to expect God to come down and applaud their magnificence. And as such, it was fun to see them get taken down a peg. Ben and Betty, you often just feel bad for them because some of the stuff that happens to them isn't their fault. It's kind of a punching down kind of thing. Zoe probably has the least amount of development, but part of that is because her overall arc was her relationship with Nate developing, them slowly getting together over the course of the show. That being said, once they were actually together, they didn't really do anything with it. Sure, they had more scenes together and basically were each other's confidants, especially Nate to Zoe, but it's not like there was a big plot where Nate had to choose trying to help Zoe over the needs of the city or something. It's almost like the rule forbidding romance really didn't have any bearing here. Zoe is an optimistic person and a problem solver, exemplified almost immediately by her. I can make a difference because I'm not afraid of big problems. I solve big problems. She was also very environmentally conscious, with some focus there in End of the Road, where she comes up with a city bicycle sharing program to reduce traffic congestion instead of cutting down a park, and having previously worked at a marine center that she recommends to help sea life after a pollution spill. We never do learn why she was washed out of the academy. Maybe at the time she bit off more than she could chew, or she caused a problem that she couldn't solve? It's never said. While most of the time her mother, the reporter seen frequently in the show, is supportive of her, there's some minor conflict between the two during an episode when a news camera records the rangers morphing and she wants to show the footage, and like when this happened with Bulk and Skull not watching it beforehand, that episode is full of journalistic issues. But Zoe has to convince her not to. Devin has character development, it's just it pretty much stops when it hits the second season, since his major storyline throughout season one was getting his dad's respect. Mayor Daniels was constantly pushing him throughout season one to get a job somewhere, make something of his life, take responsibility, seeing his video game playing and karate training as mindless hobbies. And of course, the funny thing is that despite it looking like Devin would be the immature one, caring more about video games than anything else, it's immediately clear in the second episode that he takes the job very seriously. In fact, the whole big video game player thing is mostly sidelined until season two. After that, it's just concern about his dad when he learns his body is being controlled by Evox. The third to last episode has Blaze manipulating him by making him question his leadership skills, and it's pretty masterfully done, but on the other hand, it's the third to last episode. He's been leading the Rangers for a year or two now, and it seems like that's the sort of plot that should occur earlier on than right at the end. While there are certainly some parallels to be found with Dr. K, especially with the connection to Vengex at the end, Nate is much more emotionally developed and mature than she was. It helps that while his childhood was abnormal because he spent so much time in a lab, it's not that he was denied his childhood. 
He had people who wanted what was best for him and weren't lying to him for the sake of building weapons. He had emotional love and support, and arguably Commander Shaw acted as something of a mother figure, even if it's only really evident in the episode Digital Deception when she shows such a heavy concern for his well-being when he happened to be near a monster attack. But yeah, Nate's unusual childhood. His parents work overseas doing some kind of charity work or the like, traveling around a lot and not getting to see him very often. He developed a bit of a concern that his parents didn't love him, and you can see the panic on his face when they come to visit in season two, and they inform him they can only stay for a day. But you just got here. You're going to leave me again. His desire to have a family got sated when Steel was created, finally granting him a brother. For the good and bad parts of it that entailed. He has a catchphrase of phenomenal, which just feels like the show teasing us because he never says more phenomenal, which you'd think this of all series he would. On the subject of his brother, Steel is egotistical, but not arrogant, and it makes him very charming as he discusses how gorgeous and awesome he is. But despite that ego, he's endlessly positive about everything around him. The very experience of being alive is great for him, but his fondest wish is to be human. The opportunity, of course, comes when he and Nate switch bodies and leading to the song and dance sequence that a lot of people apparently love, but I have many issues with. But even then, the song is about how wonderful it is to be human. Also, he talks like either Duffman or Clive Sinclair, which is greatly amusing to me. I think his sacrifice, while still good, would have had more weight if it had come an episode or two earlier than the finale, giving the characters a chance to reflect on the fact that the one who loved life so much knew how important it was to protect it and give up his own for it, especially since a few times throughout the series he's been willing to sacrifice himself to save others. Ravi definitely gets the most development and the best arcs, tying in two related elements. The first, of course, being his motivation to restore Roxy. We don't see it frequently, but his desire to save her is what drives him forward. And in his focus episodes, we learn that he secretly likes to do art, in particular pencil sketches and watercolors. He's pretty good, but he keeps it a secret from the team for a while because of his mother. Commander Shaw doesn't have a lot of development, being mostly just the authority who will occasionally disagree with a course of action, but one characteristic that she talks about in Ravi's episodes is a dislike for distractions away from being rangers, which is a bit odd since the rangers still clearly have normal lives and whatnot away from the base. In particular, she finds painting to be a waste of time time and a distraction. Ravi admits later that she expects him to follow in her footsteps, so he became a stickler for the rules, doing his art in secret lest she find out and force him to stop. When he finally confesses, he gets her to see the error of her ways because it's what makes him happy, and even joins him in painting once she becomes a general at the end. He's also got one of the worst episodes of the series, when Roxy thinks he's cheating on her because of a misunderstanding, and it's the standard petty ball crap fighting instead of just frickin' explaining the situation situation properly. And on the subject of Roxy, while she and Blaze basically get no development and not many appearances once they're restored, Ravi gets one of the really good season one episodes when she tries to convince him that she's turning back to being good and needs his help to finish the process. One of the episodes that took advantage of the evil Roxy thing. Though a bit undermined since we know it's an evil plot right from the start. Still, Ravi-focused episodes were usually really good and led to some of the best drama for the character. If there's a unifying theme in Beast Morphers, it's family. All of the Rangers' individual plot threads have to do with their parents. Even Steel, since while he'll argue that he's Nate's brother, in the end he's more akin to his son. Even several plots of Ben and Betty deal with their father, and they themselves are siblings. It's all about living up to family expectations, wanting to be proud of that family, not wanting to disappoint them. There isn't really a mentor for this season. Each Ranger has their own parent that they want to please, who could arguably be their mentor or motivating influence. Even seemingly unrelated characters have something to do with family. Steel inspired to try to make people better through punishment upon seeing a father discipline his daughter for littering. A video game tournament where Devin's opponent needs money for her brother. Chaku fearing that he can't go home to his daughter. Roxy trying to get her aunt to see reason about a pollution spill her company caused. If Dominic Toretto was a Power Ranger, this is the season he'd be hanging out in. It doesn't have much to say about family, and sadly I feel like there could have been more emphasis on the idea of found family, especially in Nate's case, but I suppose it is good for kids to see all sorts of different familial relationships and how, in the end, family can and should love them above all else. And that's really all there is to say about this season, in my opinion. When the history of Power Rangers returns, it will be with an evolution revolution in Power Rangers Dino Fury.
There's like there's no ending to Power Rangers. It's just gonna keep going and going. Damn. And I guess that is the end of our series because I made it a series for making four parts. I know it took us a while, but I mean, you know, sometimes in life you have to say okay i'm not gonna preach but anyways this was really fun and thank you for uh recommending this uh, i mean thank you for s requesting this um yeah uh my relationship with power rangers is not as strong as when i was younger but now that i'm watching this episodes i really really want to like start again and just watch everything through and see the changes the developments the like what i f how i feel about the show then and now and also like how it has grown how do i feel about the continuation the evolution of power rangers so let me know down in the comment section down below what you thought if you like this video don't forget to give this video a thumbs up subscribe i'll see you in the next video bye